<laughs> All righty, and I see it's recording. So I'm going to welcome everyone to our uh, volunteer engagement, working together to inspire youth webinar. Um, we are um, asking everyone to input their name and email address into the chat box. So if you have not already done that, please do so. And if you have not already um, turned off your camera, uh, we would ask you to do that as well. We're going to turn ours off after this introduction, um, but it's supposed to help save on uh, how this, uh, how Zoom functions. So without further ado, welcome. Um, and we're going to do a little introduction before we dive in. And uh, just want to let you know that this lovely webinar has been brought to you by the Professional Development Committee on Volunteerism Working Group that the three of us are representatives of. So uh, my name is Jamie Morris and I'm the Extension Specialist for 4-H Youth Development, uh, focusing on volunteer systems and development at the University of Maryland. And I am also the chair of the Volunteerism Working Group. But I am joined today in this fabulous webinar with, I'm gonna turn it over to Carrie. Okay, great. Thank you, Jamie. Um, my name is Carrie Hobbs. I serve as Extension Specialist for the University of Georgia Extension and Georgia 4-H, focusing on volunteer development, and I'm pleased to be here with you all. I'll turn it to, to Paula. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, I am Paula Lucas, and I am one of the Youth Development 4-H educators from Pennsylvania. Um, I am the co-chair, one of the co-chairs of the Volunteer Systems Working Group uh, for Penn State Extension, and so we are uh, glad to have you here today. That was a bing. Okay, so our objectives for today, um, we're, um, during this training, participants will develop an understanding of volunteer engagement and how it aligns with the ICITRA model for volunteer administration. Participants will also learn best practices to utilize when engaging volunteers in their 4-H program. Bing! <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about these terms of volunteer engagement versus volunteer management. Um, so if you all will locate your chat box at the bottom of your screen, and I want you to type in what you think of whenever you think of the term volunteer engagement. What comes to mind? Participation, trainings, communication, getting more involved, Involvement, involvement in programming and training, collaboration, I love that one, participation, hands-on involvement. Great notes, volunteering, engaging with programs, communication, excitement about the program, working together, building community, gaining buy-in. You all are absolutely correct, these um, are, essential to volunteer engagement. But let's shift our thinking for a moment and identify what comes to mind whenever you think of management. So you think of clearances and documentation and what we do, not what the volunteers are doing. Providing necessary resources, paperwork, guidance, organization, paperwork and guidance, yes. Um, so I did a little quick Google search on these terms and it turns out that Google tells me that management is the process of dealing with or controlling things or controlling people. <laughs> and engagement is to occupy or to attract or involve. So we might think a lot of our role is that volunteer management piece, the, the, proce the process of managing people, dealing it or controlling with things. Um, but our hope is that you might kind of shift that mindset and think of volunteer engagement uh, as a way to occupy or to attract and to involve your volunteers within your program. Volunteer engagement isn't a program, instead it's a mindset, is what Beth Steinhorn tells us, the president of, of 
uh, VQ volunteer strategies. It's a culture, a core organizational strategy for success. So we hope today as we go through this um, session, you'll think about how you can shift your thinking potentially from that management piece, but instead define our role as being volunteer engagers. Um, how can we occupy and attract? Volunteer engagement um, is noted as being a process, uh, um, no different than fund development or marketing. Um, we serve really as that bridge. We connect nonprofits with mission critical resources. And what a pivotal time in our, our um, world truly to look at volunteer engagement as a way that we can partner with volunteers within our, our communities to meet a, a um, goal that we all have together. Um, specifically, what I want you to think about is um, with volunteers, who is your point person within your office? So um, selecting a, a point person is going to be critical um, because it truly needs to be um, someone's role to be sure that they are occupying and attracting, um, involving volunteers throughout the full process. Um, sometimes it seems that that um, volunteer um, the utilization could in fact be um, something that is thought of on the, the back end um, of the, the thought process or the planning process. Um, but our hope is that um, it will be someone's role and this is probably possibly you um, or you've delegated this task to someone else um, to be that person that has volunteerism in the forefront of their mind and how they can can utilize um, them but also how they can can engage them with the planning um, with identifying the needs um, all the way through the full cycle of even how we can recognize volunteer successes evaluate programs and, um, and then continue on with meeting the needs of our people. Ding. Thank you for that ding. And just so you know, um, most people are going to get an email right now uh, that has uh, some resources we're going to use. If you don't get it right now, I will be sending it to you shortly. But it's my job to chat with you a little bit about Isotur. And uh, just so you know, this is where we're gonna ground our conversation in our foundational document, which is Isotur. And um, this is what mo a lot of uh, the volunteer specialists around the state use. And it's actually the ISATUR model of volunteer administration and development. So as you can see on the screen, each of those letters is in that name actually correspond to a different facet of volunteer engagement that we all as professionals get to work through. And just as a, as a note, they're all designed to create a consistent and supportive volunteer system. So as you can see, it's kind of been around since the 1970s. If this is new to you, that's fine. If it's not new to you, that's fine as well. But we are going to dive into each of these letters and talk about how it is integral to um, supporting volunteer engagement and um, just as a forewarning, some of our dives into these letters may be a little bit deeper than others, but we will be following this up with a little survey um, to see if there's any more information you'd like about any of these topics. But um, we are going to touch on all of them. Some will be a little bit deeper than others. And I'm going to bing myself. Bing! And I get to start out with identify. So as you can see on the screen, it tells you a little bit about what that means according to the ISATUR model. Um, so the, this was written in 2010 and the resource link to it is gonna be at the end of the slides. But when we think about identify, we should think about volunteer recruitment. We should think about communicating out to everybody about what are the volunteer opportunities, bringing in people that are going to meet the program needs as well as fill those volunteer roles that we 
we need filled so we can do our jobs. Um, and just as a little shout out to our National Volunteerism Charter Group, um, what you see at the bottom of this slide are actually social media graphics that the National 4-H Volunteer Charter Group put together last year that are available on 4-H.org and can be used to help recruit and promote your volunteer opportunities. Um, a link to those resources will also be provided in our follow-up email. Bing! All right, so what does it mean when we say identify volunteers? So this is going to be our meet. We're going to dive a little bit into identify. Um, but ultimately, when we talk about identifying volunteers, we're going to start way, way, way back at the beginning where you needed, where we identify your program needs. So there may be some work involved in each of these steps and ultimately to really know what your program needs in terms of volunteers. It may require conducting a needs analysis of your program um, or a needs assessment, however you want to call it. Um, you may also want to develop a staffing plan or some sort of a resource to track what volunteer positions you utilize, what volunteer positions are open. And uh, two of the resources that were sent in that email moment, moments ago actually are little um, uh, templates or samples of uh, volunteer staffing plans. Um, they could be used for your overall volunteer program. So if you're in a county or if you have volunteers in a variety of different roles, you can use that. I will share that the Excel spreadsheet looking one is actually what I've used um, in tracking and um, managing our state chaperones that we send on national trips. So it could be for a targeted program or volunteer opportunity. It could be for all of them. But ideally, what you want to know is what are the needs of your program? What are the openings or vacancies? Because ultimately, what you want to do is find people that will fit your needs, not just fit into a volunteer, not just the people that want to volunteer. So really, you want to focus on your volunteer needs so you can support your program. And a thing to keep in mind is that there are going to be a lot of people that will want to volunteer that may not fit your needs. And ultimately, you want to make sure that volunteers are engaged and active because then they're going to have a lower propensity to create any conflicts, problems, and concerns. So, another thing that we're going to encourage you to do is educate about 4 H and volunteer opportunities. So another resource that is on uh, 4-H.org is a 2010 volunteer recruitment and retention research uh, that was conducted by National 4-H Council that concluded that it's necessary to focus on getting the right message out about the organization and the more education about how and why we do what we do and less specific subject area information can cause non-volunteers to become involved. In fact, you have a two times greater chance of getting those non-volunteers involved. The reason they may not be involved is because they don't understand what we do. So a good way to start this whole identification process is by educating people on what we do. Another conclusion from that research actually notes that using advocates, using collaborators, using people that are your partners to share the knowledge and share the, the word about volunteer opportunities is actually a good method because they can reach out, they can share those opportunities. They may know people in different aspects of your community that you don't know and they can, they can communicate and be your advocates. The one thing I would encourage you to do is make sure that everybody is using the same playbook. So providing them some information about what you're looking for, making sure that they are communicating what you want and making sure that they're focusing on those positive youth development um, strategies. A couple other things to think about is since we all have lots going on and we want to use our time wisely, being intentional about your volunteer recruitment efforts um, rather than just, you know, hoping for the best or, you know, uh, sh sending everything out in the world, uh, be really targeted and, and intentional about it. Now, we all probably do communicate what kind of volunteer opportunities we're looking to fill with mass marketing efforts through email on Facebook. Ultimately, you may be drawing in some 
uh, volunteers, some individuals to help out, but using some more targeted and direct emails, direct conversations, direct requests may actually be more fruitful. So be, be mindful of what information you're putting out, how you're putting it out, and um, be really intentional about who you're reaching out to. One of the big hot topics in volunteerism nowadays is uh, first generation volunteers, as well as volunteers that have really specific skill sets. So if you're looking for a STEM person, you know, you need somebody that maybe has engineering or math or has, you know, certain uh, hobbies and, and professional um, traits. So being really mindful about how do you reach out to them? So this is one of the things we're not gonna dive too deeply about, but one of the things that the national resources say is to think about um, avenues that you haven't pursued, places you haven't put out information. So be, be uh, creative in where you're putting out your information. So if you're looking for someone that let's say has a propensity for robotics, Go to those hobby stores, go to, to uh, places that would have those kind of, that kind of equipment and promote it there. Um, and when you're thinking about recruitment efforts, um, I would highly encourage you to check out those national um, marketing resources on 4-H.org. So there is much more to say about this, but that gives you a little taste and we are gonna talk about the next letter in Isotur now. Bing! And the next letter is S for selection. And, and as you can see uh, um, uh, by the definition on the slide, I'm sure you guys are thinking about all of those things that go into bringing volunteers into our program. And I'm, I'm sure it may be rising or bringing on certain emotions. Um, I will say in Maryland, we call this process our volunteer onboarding. So we are trying to select volunteers and get them prepared to serve in specific roles. And that's gonna require specific steps. The one thing I'm gonna stress here, and I'm gonna try to slow down my talk so I can stress it, the steps that are incorporated into your onboarding process are designed to provide you and everyone protection. And it also assures that the individuals that are working with you on behalf of your program and your organization are vetted for safety. So we may not like this part of the process, but ultimately this is the best protection that we have. And in legalese, it's doing our due diligence to select individuals to work with you to create a safe and caring environment as emphasized in the essential elements. Bing! So when we say that we need to select volunteers, first and foremost, it's necessary to keep in mind that volunteers serve at the pleasure and discretion of the 4-H program. Yes, they do give of their time, energy, and expertise freely. And no, we could not reach as many youth or provide as many programs without them. But unfortunately, not everyone is cut out to be a 4-H volunteer. And one of the questions I've been asked in my role as a volunteer specialist is how can we honor our equal opportunity statement of being open to all if we don't allow anyone and everyone that wants to volunteer that opportunity? So unfortunately, due to the vulnerable nature of our population and the nature of the world today, we would be remiss and potentially in legal jeopardy if we just let everyone volunteer. So in reality, all who wish to volunteer may apply, but not everybody's gonna be able to volunteer. And that's what this whole selection process is about because it's going to vet them. And that's gonna usually start with an application. So I'm sure you all have a volunteer application and on it, you know it's gonna require specific personal information, including employment, volunteer experience, references, it also gives you the authority or the organization the authority to conduct a background and a reference check. And these are considered the screening process for that volunteer. The one thing that I do stress with our um, faculty and staff in Maryland is that um, when a volunteer applies or when someone applies, we may need to communicate with them that they can't officially say they are a volunteer or serve in a volunteer role until this whole process is done. So that, that's just a protection for you, for them, and everyone involved. 
So after your application, there's usually a background check, which every state is a little different, but all youth development organizations, including scouts, uh, schools, churches, including 4-H, require a background check. And this determines that individual suitability to volunteer with youth. This is one of the best tools we have at our disposal, and it does need to be managed consistently and confidentially. Um, the level, method, and frequency of the checks will depend on your institution, and most will require some sort of commercial criminal background check, and as well as a check of the sex offenders database. So obviously you guys know your process. If you don't, you're gonna consult with your program or your institution for specific steps and criteria. But again, know that this step provides you and the volunteer some really good protection as to their ability to serve with youth. After the background check, there's usually a reference check, which is a way to attest for an individual's ability or suitability to volunteer. There are some mixed opinions as to the value of a reference check and many think, hey, everyone can get at least two people to write something nice about them, which could be true. Uh, but the thing I like to put out there and I suggest that you think of is that when you give a reference for someone else, you are vouching for them and your name is associated with that reference and with them. Not that you're going to hold the reference liable for the actions of the applicant, but you would hope that a reference would take the act of writing reference seriously. So those, those that don't, it's probably going to come across and you can take that into consideration when you're screening them. Usually what follows is an interview, which is essential if you don't know the applicant, but can be very enlightening even if you do. And although there's some flexibility in how interviews are conducted over the phone, in person, over the web, in a group setting, it is recommended that a consistent process be used, including structured questions and a method of recording, and it be conducted by a consistent person or persons if you wanna do a panel. Um, and then in the end, the hiring authority will have that final say in selecting an individual to serve, but they are selected and then officially appointed. And ding, that leads to our volunteer appointment. So whoever is that authority for the volunteer process will appoint applicants to specific volunteer roles, like we talked about earlier. You wanna fill the roles that are filling the needs of the program. So, um, Remember, everyone can apply, but not everybody's gonna volunteer. So individuals that have passed the background screening, reference check, interview process, and have the skills that meet the needs of the vacant or available roles are gonna be assigned to those positions. Um, and all of that's gonna be documented. So yes, we get to do paperwork. And again, keep in mind that this paperwork, this process is designed to provide you that appropriate legal liability protection and accountability for the volunteer. So typically your appointment, again, is going to align with that um, individual's, or sorry, the program's needs. It'll align with the individual's skills, which if you, you can glean that from the interview, from the references. If you don't have that information or you need more, there um, are several different ways to gather uh, information about their skills and interests. One of the resources we'll share will be after our uh, webinar, will include um, a little uh, survey that you could use. But then ultimately, once it's all said and done, they have a position, you know they're gonna serve, you're gonna make it official. And most, uh, most programs include a variety of paperwork to document this and legally protect everybody. So typically there's gonna be an appointment agreement, which is like a contract. Um, there's gonna be a position description that's gonna include all of their duties um, as well as other information about their specific role. In Maryland, that position description is what provides them um, legal liability protection. It may be similar in your state. That's something you'd have to check out. And then most 4-H programs actually have a code of conduct for adults. And this is those um, clear expectations of behavior and prohibited items, actions, as well as potentially um, the disciplinary policy and procedure. All in all though, 
A volunteer should be appointed when they're prepared to serve, which demonstrates the flexibility of the ISOTER model since preparation will come in the next steps, which is orientation and training. Bing! Thank you, Jamie. So next, let's take a look at, oh, our third letter of ISATUR, orientation. So orientation is that process of orienting volunteers to the expectation of 4-H youth programs and their role. It's essential that we're, we're doing this. Um, we think of this as new volunteer training and support, um, but it is also important um, for us to note that um, volunteers need to to have ongoing orientation um, that then will update them on any changes within um, your policies and procedures or um, organizational shifts. So um, in some ways, this isn't a, a one-time um, one um, trained and then you're done with orientation. Instead, you can think of it as um, continuing to um, provide information on any new adjustments that are necessary to make sure they're a welcome part of your team. One thing you might consider is um, incorporating seasoned volunteers into that welcoming orientation um, for your new volunteers um, so that they can feel well connected within um, your community. Also, um, it could be important for seasoned volunteers to come in and share experiences um, of um, their time and also provide um, some insight into what um, volunteer roles and opportunities might be available. Overall, an orientation um, should provide a consistent overview of information for these individuals to prepare them for their volunteer service role. Ding. Ding. <laughs> so there are a few basic things that you'll want to consider within um, an orientation structure. Um, for one, you'll want to tell them a little bit about your organization and um, the history of your organization. So how you came to be and, and um, truly what you are today. Um, provide an overview of 4-H, 4-H youth development, um, and an introduction to um, your university's extension. You're really providing that gateway and welcoming them um, to be a part of your organization. You want to, of course, include essential elements of youth development so that um, they truly understand how we approach um, youth within our, our programs. It's good to provide them with an office facility tour um, so that they uh, understand um, the layout of your office as well as what amenities might be available to them. Um, it could, you may also have um, some special features that are available for volunteers within your office, such as a, a coffee maker perhaps that they could use that you might want to point out to them. Um, it's also a great time to talk about the meeting space that you have in your, your building and um, how that volunteer could go about reserving um, meeting spaces if they were to become a, a program leader with one of your programs. This is also a nice time to bring in um, faculty, staff um, that are paid and unpaid uh, to have introductions within um, your local program so that those new volunteers truly feel a great welcome into uh, your organization. Of course, um, we are in the, the business of working with the vulnerable population of youth and in this case, um, it's essential that we're providing consistent um, standardized trainings on policies and procedures. So an orientation is a great time to give an overview of those policies and procedures, um, as well as, um, so not just stopping at the university policies and procedures, but also um, talking about um, some of the practices that take place in your office. Um, such as um, maybe you need a, a week, week's time to um, have copies printed for um, newsletters to go out. Um, maybe you have a deadline monthly of when the newsletters um, will be sent to print. And all of those um, things could be shared back with volunteers for them to be successful. 
This is a great time to share expectations. Um, so not just your expectations of what you have with um, for the volunteer, but also hearing from volunteers what their expectations are for serving in that volunteer role so that you can have a more successful uh, partnership in understanding what they're hoping to gain from, from their service. Again, communicating any of those um, local timelines and also sharing what your volunteer opportunities are. So this is a great time to share a menu of what you offer within your program and then where you're really seeking to have additional support. So certainly you may be onboarding them into one role, but during the process of sharing with them your menu of opportunities, you might find there are other roles that they're interested in um, assisting with as well. Um, overall, you'll want to take this orientation time to spend a little more time with the um, volunteer to get to know that volunteer so that this can be a, a great experience for you both. So in addition to um, thinking through what to be included in your orientation, you'll also want to consider formats that are going to be appropriate for your audience. And um, sometimes it's not a one size fits all. You might even need to explore various formats. Um, in example, we're right in the midst of this right now. We're looking at um, how many formats can um, we extend resources through primarily digitally um, so that we can meet the needs of our, our people during COVID-19 crisis. <laughs> Um, some formats, though, um, that you might consider, of course, what um, formats that are in person are going to be important for you to understand um, personalities. Um, at this point in time, whether it's meeting in your office or meeting through a, a Zoom or a um, connection link, um, any of these could, could be fine, but having that um, that connection with an individual instead of just strictly an asynchronous type um, training. Uh, you might though look for an asynchronous training. So there may be no reason to tell the history of your organization over and over, but instead maybe there's a video that shares the history of your organization that you could share through an, or through an orientation. What Georgia has moved to is to having blended orientations where we have uh, developed uh, videos of the history of 4-H, um, also essential elements of youth development, and then a third video that includes an overview of Georgia 4-H programs and how we um, how we're structured throughout um, throughout our state, in which case we're placed in all 159 counties and volunteers may have different roles and offices may look different within 159 counties. So we really set up um, those three videos for volunteers to watch in advance. Um, they're each um, 15 minutes or less. And then we would invite um, new uh, volunteers into our office um, to join a group to then um, further share about their experience and their expectations. Um, so you'll see this group um, here in this orientation slide. This was from one of our pilot groups um, in Houston County in Georgia that um, went through our um, Georgia 4-H getting started um, orientation and um, they had a, a um, great feedback to share back. We did ask them for an evaluation um, so that we could improve the model before extending it to other volunteers. And um, overall, they were truly excited that they had the opportunity to come and hear about the programs. And, um, and um, you'll see um, one of the moms in this photo, she was in particular proud that she learned that she could become a, a club leader during this time where otherwise um, she truly just thought she was signing up to do another role, um, but understood that there was a, a need for a service leader. So she was proud that she could assist in additional ways. I challenge you to look at how you might frame your orientation for volunteers just to make sure that it's a welcoming environment that sets up volunteers for success. And I'll also um, challenge you to think of how are you incorporating seasoned volunteers into that welcome so that you can assist them, at the new volunteers, with being a part of, of that team. Ding! 
So um, we talked about orientation. The next um, in ISATUR is training. And certainly these can be uh, very closely connected because in some ways orientation is the beginning of the training, right? And, um, and then of course this training piece um, can be continually throughout a, a volunteer's experience. So you'll see from PLES, PLESCAC 2010, um, training is the process of stimulating and preparing volunteers to acquire knowledge and to develop attitudes and skills necessary to en enable them to be successful in their volunteer roles. This includes ongoing training through a variety of delivery methods. Ding. So let's um, dive into training a little bit further and um, think through what training could look like um, within your local program. First, of course, you'll want to consider the service role and um, the time that it's going to take for them to complete that training. Um, in some cases, you need to send them to a full um, orientation and, um, and then maybe a weekend of, of training. But in other ways, um, you might be onboarding volunteers um, for an episodic opportunity where the orientation and training may closely intertwine and um, be a, a shorter, um, in, until a shorter amount of training. So an example I would provide is, um, we onboard a lot of judges who evaluate young people for um, giving demonstrations. And in this case, um, these individuals are not working directly with kids. Um, instead, they're evaluating the work of young people and um, and sharing back a score. And so in these cases, we might look to a more abbreviated training. Certainly we want to make sure our judges um, understand um, what the criteria is and how to evaluate these projects fairly and consistently. Um, but they don't necessarily have to go through all of our risk um, protective measures and um, orientation, although we would hope that they would want to do those things and become more involved in our program. Um, if they were to work with young people, they would have to um, have to do those additional steps. But you will want to conser consider the service role and the time that is required. So in, in that case, the time that is required is about four hours of service, it would truly be overkill for the four hours of service if they had to come to five days of training, you see. Um, you'll really want to consider what, what that opportunity is though and what it is appropriate, um, what is the appropriate amount of time for the training. In some cases where you're hosting an event, you might send um, you know, a detailed letter in advance um, and if you've already onboarded these individuals and they've gone through youth protective training, maybe the training for this um, event might be an activity huddle where you pull the group together just to make sure they're all on the same page and then you continue on with, with your event um, or the, the start of your event. Um, one case that where I think of with this is if you need, needed um, individuals to come and help you set up for an event, um, you might have a huddle with them in advance. Um, let's start the first um, 20 minutes together just to make sure we're all on the same page and have a game plan and everybody is, has arrived. And, um, and then you can share your plan for the day and um, let every, everyone then disperse and serve, including yourself. Sometimes though, it, um, you do need to have more in-depth training. And of course, this is going to be required as um, you have summer camp volunteers or shooting sports volunteers. If they have a, a, um, a large engagement with um, young people, close connection with young people, of course, they're going to have um, need more training. You'll also want to consider um, ongoing, ongoing training. So potentially volunteer updates, what refreshers are you offering? Um, you might even ask volunteers to note what refreshers they need and, um, and how they want to receive this training. 
so again, you'll want to offer a variety um, of options, offer flexible training methods um, that are based on the, ro the roles that you have. Um, in Georgia, we surveyed our volunteers across program areas. So this did not include just 4-H, but it in also include Master Gardener Extension volunteers. So when you reference the um, slide on the right, you'll see a graph. The red um, bars note 4-H respondents, the gray in the middle um, note Master Gardener um, responses who had completed their risk management training and the, the black included master gardeners who had not completed a risk management training. And so the reason why we conducted this survey is we wanted to get to the heart of whether we were offering training in the best possible way as we were onboarding boarding volunteers with our um, risk management training. And we had some volunteers who had not completed the training and we were just simply trying to figure out why. Um, as you look at this chart, you'll see that um, where the bars are super high um, are where the volunteer preference was, which is an online training with a quiz. Um, note that the second highest is the online training. So um, what we found that was um, quite interesting here in Georgia is that volunteers across program areas, even the ones who hadn't completed the training yet, preferred for, um, for this training to be offered online. They wanted to, to complete this um, training at their homes. They wanted a quiz though to also um, accompany that online training. And when asked why, um, we figured out that it was because they wanted to show that they gained the mastery of that subject. Um, so this may or may not apply to your volunteers, but I will tell you it was a really great lesson for us to learn um, that um, while we may hear some grumblings about quizzes, um, majority of our people actually want the quiz. And so uh, for that reason, we would continue to um, offer quizzes with um, trainings that we, we had just so they had that opportunity to display the mastery. Other things that we found in this particular survey is that our 4-H volunteers are so flexible with trainings as they're needed. Um, they really um, overwhelmingly noted that um, they're happy to complete trainings as they're necessary. Um, they want heads up of the training. Um, two, two weeks is good. Um, a month is maybe even better, but they were happy with even getting a heads up of two, two weeks before you needed them to complete, um, complete the training. So um, all that to say, um, volunteers noted that they valued training and that they wanted training, wanted training to be offered not just for them, but also for um, their partners um, within the volunteer team because they felt that they could better serve um, individuals and serve their communities with this training. Ding. So we'll next move into um, utilization. So you, you've trained these volunteers for their role and now it's time for their service. All right, thank you, Carrie. So we are now going to look at the U in the Isotur model, which is utilization. Utilization is the process of providing the opportunity for volunteers to put acquired knowledge and skills into action in the most appropriate way to function in a supportive environment. This includes support for volunteers to actively carry out responsibilities and to provide opportunities for mentoring from other volunteers and paid staff. Bing! Utilization is putting knowledge and skills of volunteer in, volunteers into action. There are many ways we can utilize volunteers. There are also many considerations when using, vol, utilizing volunteers. Creating a welcoming environment is key in utilizing volunteers. One way to do this is to have a smile when they come in the door and on the phone. Another way is to designate a coffee pot for volunteers, as Carrie mentioned, or a space in the fridge for their lunch. Providing these resources makes them feel, feel like they are part of the team. We should have a spirit of service with our volunteers. You ask, what does this mean? Well, 
we are asking them to serve us, so we need to find ways to serve and support them. We should have a positive outlook on what we are doing and why we are doing it. If they ask for something, we need to ask ourselves, is it reasonable? And if so, we should do it or try to accommodate. Remember, they are giving freely of themselves, so we need to find ways to support them as they support us. When utilizing volunteers, match volunteer placement with their skills and comfort levels. This also relates to the identify and selection parts of the ISATURE model we just talked about. Ensure volunteer placement is meaningful. Offer an opportunity that suits where their motive is. After volunteers participate in trainings, match them in areas with these new skills they just learned. Utilize volunteers in areas where they're comfortable working and have knowledge. All of these empower them to be successful. Another part of utilizing volunteers is to delegate responsibilities to volunteers. Ensure that tasks are that are delegated are not too easy or not too hard. Provide volunteers position descriptions for successful delegation. Be ready to put the volunteers to work when they are assigned a responsibility. Provide opportunities for them to be mentors. Through all of this, we need to be balancing our requirements with the benefits of volunteering. Seek input and honor suggestions from volunteers. Be open to new ideas. Be available when volunteers need you. Provide professional development opportunities. And we can't stress this enough. You keep hearing this through each of our conversations about communication. We wanna be open and transparent in communications to all. This is key in volunteer engagement. So as you're utilizing your volunteers, ensure you are clear and open in communication. Have regular contact with volunteers and ensure you reach out to them um, using the preference method that they um, give to you. This could be via phone, call, email, club, or activity visit. An example is a Friday Blast email. Remember, personal communications are important. They should be targeted and directed. Mass communications are also important. Examples of these would be newsletters or other forms of communication. Within these mass communications, this is a good opportunity to highlight volunteer opportunities and also highlight what, what volunteers have done. This can help increase participation in specific programs in the future. The use of social media can help increase vol volunteer participation as well. Social media can be used to promote events and activities. It can be also, also be used to highlight volunteer efforts. Blogs or video up updates are another great way to communicate. Remember, signups are a great way to get help from volunteers. Be sure to have a variety of opportunities with them in mind when you ask for signups. And remember, there's many different online signup tools that exist as well. So there's many ways you can get them to sign up for helping you so that you're able to best utilize your volunteers. Bing! We are now going to look at the R in the ISATURE model, which is recognition. Recognition is the process of recognizing and rewarding volunteers for their contribution and performance. This includes ongoing recognition through formal and non-formal methods. Bing! Recognition is acknowledging and rewarding volunteers. This is another important part of volunteer engagement. It motivates volunteers to stay involved. It builds on respect and appreciation. Whenever we talk about recognition, there are two forms of recognition. They include formal and informal. We need to remember formal recognition is awards and informal can, thought of, can be thought of as appreciation. Formal examples include being honored at events, being included in news articles, receiving certificates or tokens of appreciation, and writing thank you note letters or notes to the volunteers. There are also many ways we can provide information informal recognition to volunteers. Timely communications about new developments in programs is an example of informal recognition. Another way to provide is providing financial support for volunteer skill development with scholarships or grants to attend trainings. Note that general re generational research supports this with the younger generations. We can also provide volunteers the opportunity to mentor new volunteers. Providing feedback and new responsibilities is a great type of informal recognition. Remember to thank your volunteers and be creative on the way you show appreciation. 
We also want to remind you that National Volunteer Appreciation Week is April 19th through the 25th, but you can show appreciation all year long. Bing. Now we are going to look at the E in the Isotur model, which is evaluation. Evaluation is the process of determining how well volunteers are doing in their role, providing useful feedback, assisting volunteers in achieving personal goals, and learning from the volunteer strategies to improve their role and organization. This includes evaluation to create, adapt, and expand organizational volunteer delivery systems. Bing. Evaluation is formal and informal volunteer performance evaluation. It is also providing feedback. It is an essential part of volunteer engagement. Evaluation is a necessary part of supporting our volunteers to help them obtain the desired results. Evaluation can be conducted both formally and informally. Sometimes a formal evaluation is necessary and sometimes it is not. When formal evaluation is being conducted, the communication and attitude should be kept positive. Examples include a volunteer exit survey, a volunteer impact survey, or an annual volunteer evaluation. Other times, informal evaluation is the key that you want to be using. By providing feedback that is needed to support volunteers, informal evaluation can be very helpful. Examples include a volunteer service survey and a feedback form used for a club meeting. Evaluation is a key way to determine if desired results are being obtained or not. When you hear evaluation, remember there are many methods that you can use. Evaluation data can be collected by a paper, online, clickers, observation, and many more ways. Keep in mind you are gathering information to improve your programming and to improve their volunteer experience. You don't want to over-evaluate, so it's key to find a balance. Open communication and ongoing volunteer support is key in volunteer engagement. Bing! So, um, we are rounding out our session. Thank you, uh, Paula and Carrie, for your information and your support in this. Um, just to keep everybody sane, uh, we know that working with volunteers can be overwhelming and a we covered a lot in the Isotur model and there is a lot that is involved in volunteer engagement. But kind of want to just, you know, put everything in perspective. Um, I found this quote from Francis Assisi, which actually kind of uh, mirrors uh, my experience uh, dealing with volunteer engagement. And sometimes we got to make it bite-sized pieces. So we don't want to have stressed anybody out and we we understand that there's a lot to think about it but in reality everything in the isotur model all of the steps all of the suggestions they are there to help provide you and your volunteers those legal protections and if we ramped up anyone's stress level or caused any anxiety we apologize but if you read what francis assisi said um, maybe it will help calm you down and we're going to give some final um, suggestions that came from our committee. But honestly, thinking of what is really necessary for you to do and then doing what's possible may, will actually lead to at reaching out and being more creative and doing what you might have originally thought was impossible. And ultimately, our volunteers are so essential to our programs, I would hope that we would want to do the impossible for them because they do seemingly impossible things for us. But I'm gonna to toss it over to Carrie to give some last thoughts on some of these suggestions and anything else. Yeah, so thank you, Jamie. Um, again, we hope that you don't get um, overwhelmed with this session. Um, it truly is to provide you a, a framework of um, what you could use to further develop your volunteer program. Um, you might find that you already have some of these um, pieces in place, or you might find that you're you're starting at just one piece to get, um, get the ball rolling. Um, but just identifying that you might be the person within your office um, to be that that volunteer advocate um, and volunteer point person is a great place to start. Um, you'll also see these, um, these suggestions of um, processing and onboarding volunteers quickly and effectively could be helpful for you. 
um, identify immediate needs and build that relationship, um, building connections to the larger piece. Um, Jamie mentioned balancing risk management and not allowing it to be a barrier for volunteers. Um, I would also say don't let training be a barrier um, for volunteers to try to, to tear down the, the obstacles that might, um, might arise. Um, of course, you want to make sure you can find ways, though, to engage your volunteers. I can't say that word enough, um, so that you are um, involving them throughout the process of ISATURE and your, your program planning. We encourage you to not only, though, stop with um, your volunteers, but also reach out to your state specialist um, within your state. And um, if you are a state specialist, reach out to your, um, your professional development volunteerism working group um, to assist further with um, support with developing your volunteer program. But kudos to you for being on board today and for being an advocate for volunteers. Um, we know because you came today, it is because you're interested in this topic and how you can utilize um, volunteers to grow your needs and expand your efforts. But also we're very hopeful that you're interested in how you can get, engage them throughout the process. And to wrap us up, um, our contact information is here of um, Jamie, myself, and Paula. Um, we encourage you to reach out to us if we can be of any assistance to you. And also, Jamie has plans to send um, you an evaluation so that we can um, further grow from this session as presenters. We hope that you'll take the time to complete that and give us your honest opinions. And then also she has plans to follow up with some additional resources for you. Absolutely. So we have a best practices sheet that we were putting together based on the information from this presentation, as well as some resources. So uh, be on the lookout for that. And then also, as uh, Carrie reminded you, uh, there is evaluation coming just to see how uh, what you gain from this, but also to see what the uh, volunteerism working group might be able to provide for you in the future. So feel free to reach out. And if anybody has any questions now, I think we have three minutes before the end of our session. Um, so we can stay on the line and answer any questions if you want to put them in the chat box or unmute if you want to share them. But thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Carrie and Paula, for being such fabulous uh, working group members and putting this together. I want to give a shout out to our working group who uh, supported this and uh, contributed to it, as well as a thank you to Jim and JJ and to MJ for allowing us to present today. And it looks like there's a question, Paula, about the third evaluation you mentioned when evaluating volunteers. I'm looking back now. I know Paula's still, uh, she is still- I'm still here, just a second. Oh, okay. okay. I was looking back at, your, at the notes too, so. I'm wondering if it's the service survey. Yes, so I had I had I had lists for both formal and informal examples, so I'll just read both mm -hmm. of them over again. Um, okay. So some formal examples that our working group came up with that you could think about: a volunteer exit survey, a volunteer impact survey, and an annual evaluation. So it'd be an annual volunteer eva evaluation. Um, informal examples: um, there were two of those that we gave: um, the volunteer service survey and a feedback form for a club meeting. And Rebecca said she had annual and exit didn't catch. And I think she probably didn't catch the, the, for, the feedback or the service. Yeah, the service survey or the feedback. Yeah, thank you, Paula. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. I'm just scanning to see if there's any other questions, which I'm not seeing any other. And lots of thank yous coming in. And thank you all. Yes, I hope you all are staying well. That's what I was just about to say. Hopefully everybody <laughs> is staying healthy and staying safe.
And uh, Rebecca asked if we could share some of the evaluation templates. And I know the ones that uh, Maryland uh, has, I am more than happy to put those into the resource um, file that y'all will get to. Interested in the club feedback form. Yep. As well as the service evaluation. Awesome. And I know we have in Maryland, um, we are just finalizing our fast feedback form, which that would be kind of like the club feedback. And then we do something in 4-H um, online for our service. So I can, um, can add those questions in there as well. Oh, and Brenda from West Virginia is interested in the training Carrie shared. Okay, great. I'm happy to add um, some pieces, Jamie, to the resource box. Yeah. Absolutely. The more we share, the merrier, I figure. Yeah. Oh, um, Brenda wanted to clarify. She wanted oh. the, yeah, you see it? Yes. So Brenda, I'm pleased to tell you that um, that has been submitted for a publication and, and it's under review currently with the Journal of um, Human Sciences and Extension. So we're very hopeful that we can, can share that out very soon. And Tammy, your question, uh, how do you quantify volunteer hours and do you ask them to submit their time? So uh, I can attest for Maryland, uh, for the last couple of years, we have asked them to approximate their hours of service um, when they re-enroll each year. So we just have some simple questions, you know, how many hours did you uh, volunteer? How many youth did you serve? And what roles did you serve? Quantifying volunteer service hours is not something we do right now because uh, we just started trying to gather just some basic information that we can use. But I'm not sure if Paula or Carrie, if you guys have answers to those questions as well. Yeah, yeah so I, I'll jump. Uh, oh, Carrie, you can go next. Okay. Um, so I will tell you that we very much estimate here in Georgia. Um, so some volunteers might fill out a form. Um, it really depends on what program they're engaged in and also um, what county they're in. Um, but collectively, what we do throughout the state is within our volunteer management system, um, we can then enroll volunteers into activities as they complete them and we have a way to estimate their amount of time that then we'll collect um, volunteer time on the county scale but then also um, tally it up for the the state scale as well so i guess um, to answer your question um, tammy it kind of depends <laughs> <laughs> Um, but we do have that feature within our 4-H enrollment system to, to collect it by county mm. and by state. So for Pennsylvania, Tammy, um, what we've been doing for the past several years, we have an annual volunteer impact survey um, that we conduct each fall. And whenever we send that out, we ask them to summarize um, how many hours they, um, they estimate that they spent in that, that previous year. Um, and so counties are able to aggregate the data out. And so they could find out how many service hours there were in the county. And then the, um, then the state, we have that as well. And so we use that for uh, our, our state impact survey as well. Um, so we, we had been gathering that um, by a survey monkey. Now we're moving to Qualtrics. Um, and then that data is available to county educators. And so we conducted it as an online survey from the state level um, where they got the blast emails from uh, 4-H online. Ooh, Paula, I would love to, to have a copy of that. <laughs> So, so this, well, in this past year, so Jamie and I are both on the Northeast, um, we're within that Northeast um, Leadership Working Group that Jamie had mentioned in the beginning, we're actually, um, we postponed our state-specific one this year um, because um, later this month, um, we should have a Northeast United States ones going, going out, and, and Jamie can, can speak more of that. Um, are we, are we have different questions we ask every year. Um, we've, had, we've tried to mix it up and gather a variety of things, but one that we've been consistent with each year um, is the number of hours. And so I can most definitely put um, one of our samples in the re resources for um, document for everyone to be able to see. Yeah, the, the big conversation um, lately though seems to be even talking, um, you know, past hours, but showing mm -hmm 
impact and sh sharing the stories and even taking the pictures. Um, so I would even challenge you also to, um, you know, as you see volunteers in action, snap the photo um, or even ask other people within your community to snap um, photos. Charge volunteers with taking taking photos of other volunteers. Um, they don't typically love to take photos of themselves, <laughs> I've found, um, but they can truly be valuable in sharing our story. Um, certainly incorporating those, um, those hours, but then all the impacts that they're making is just um, phenomenal. And I will agree with you, Carrie. So uh, in reference to what uh, Paula was sharing, our Northeast Regional Volunteer Impact Survey, it will gather some service data, but the big questions are all about their impact. So we kind of designed it to ask questions about how um, they, how volunteers feel they have impacted youth, impacted the community, impacted the organization, as well as what kind of impact they have had on themselves. So you're right, that's, that's like that trend in volunteerism and trying to gather those stories. And that's so essential when we're trying to educate and promote about 4-H, because just saying how many people volunteered or how many hours, that doesn't really speak to the people we want to draw in. And interestingly enough, what you just suggested um, our, um, we have a new IT and marketing person and she actually has been uh, trying to do just that and she has now tasked our Maryland 4-H State Council with being those community advocates to do the same thing that you just mentioned, taking pictures at events, getting some information from people that are attending events when we can attend events again, that is, um, but to actually get those stories so we can start marketing and using that in our promotional pieces. Yeah, that's all so great. Um, I see where Charlene um, has noted that in Rockdale County, um, they are um, completing a, a mock check and presenting it at the annual mm -hmm. award ceremony. Um, Charlene, that's a great idea. Thank you for sharing that. Um, it, it truly helps people see a, a value whenever you can add it up um, to a, a total amount and also um, some people convert that over into money um, with volunteer time but I might even argue though that that money is worth more than more. what the check says. <laughs> yeah absolutely uh, yeah, yeah well and Charlene also has in there about that um, taking Carrie, number of hours time, Charlene, but... oh Charlene did you have something to say yeah, I can send you, I've actually made the mock check um, and I can send you the um, oh. out of it. And I changed the year up at the top. The year is like the check number um, and then put like volunteers and it, it really looks like a check and it's really eye opening, especially for like commissioners and mm -hmm. people who might attend the volunteer or attend the award ceremony just for them to see that number as small as Rockdale County is. Um, we're one of the smallest counties in the state it's always like 20 plus thousand dollars. So it's almost mm -hmm. a full time person just in volunteer hours. Small state with a lot of, of um, dynamic people though, Charlene. So I'm glad that you have um, so many volunteers there that do contribute so, so many great things. And you're exactly right. That check is, is one thing that um, sends a message to um, some people that would be in attendance for um, for sure. Yeah. And Absolutely. Charlene add also about the um, calculating out the rate. And so mm -hmm. we all we calculate that out um, using our Pennsylvania data and the impact survey that I mentioned, um, we include that figure in there as well, um, as law as well as other impact data. And we've got the pictures and stuff that that Carrie mentioned, I um, mean, you know, provide a variety of in, in information into this, um, into the impact survey, and then it can be adjusted for the at the county level to have it county specific if they wanted to for their commissioners and legislators as well. Um, so I'll gladly put that up in the resources as well. We yeah. could always add the independent sector uh, uh, website to our resource document too because that's exactly where you'd find that that number to multiply it by. Mm -hmm. Charlene please do share that check that's great. Mm. And if you give us permission, we'll put it in our resource document and yes, use it and cite you for it. <laughs> we'll make your check famous. <laughs> so I, I see the question from Tammy. I think it's related to Georgia about 4-H online. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping Tammy is still on the call, but um, 
I will know. Let's see. She looks like she is. Um, great. So um, Tammy, Georgia 4-H actually does not utilize 4-H online. We have an in-house system called 4-H enrollment um, where we manage our um, our youth data for membership as well as volunteers and, and um, have our volunteer roster there. Um, it collects our volunteer paperwork and is our database for tracking volunteer certifications and trainings. <laughs> and in Pennsylvania, we do use uh, 4-H online. As we do in Maryland too. And just so you know, 4-H online 2.0 is being piloted in Maryland. So we're, we're trying to work off, out all the kinks for y'all that use it. <laughs> I am not seeing any other questions, y'all. Well, thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. Absolutely. I'm going to stop sharing and uh, no, I want to stop sharing. <laughs> there we go. Now I have stopped sharing. I think we still have a couple people on the line, but I guess we are done. Yes. Thank you all. And um, I'm assuming, Jim, you'll get this posted at some point on the NAE4HA website. Oh, Jim is still on. It looks like he's there. I see MJ is still on. I'm wondering if... Uh, MJ, would we be able to post the documents that we're going to share out to? Um, if you I'm can email that to me, I can put it in the email blast out to membership that the oh. webinar has been posted to the website. Okay. And would they go. be able to be posted up on the, in the archives with the, with the link to the, or with the video itself? Yeah, I can put it underneath the like embedded image of the screenshot cool. or the video screenshot. Awesome. When we get it finalized, we will send it to you then. Awesome. Cool. All right, everybody. Thank oh. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Good job as always. <laughs>